Hey, good morning, everybody. Um, I'll just switch on my cameras so you can see that I'm digitally actually here um, and actually physically in the location that you see in the picture behind me. So uh, for once, actually, the picture does justice to the weather. So it's a beautiful morning in Cape Town. Um, and thank you for joining. Um, uh, happy that you could uh, sort of dial in to what I think is a fairly interesting, possibly uh, slightly different uh, uh, overview or, or understanding of global um, dynamics in terms of the middle class or even how we think about income shares and consumers around the world. So I'm hoping that it's going to be um, fairly simple to follow, but in particular, just uh, I found at least working through the data, particularly illuminating in how we like to think about um, uh, middle classes around the world. So what I'm going to do in the language, so the global middle class was the um, was the marketing department's way to get me away from, from being too technical, but uh, the technical term is to call these individuals uh, as being part of the global consumer class, right? Uh, just because middle class is a little bit confusing if you think of distributions and where the middle class lies and so on, and why the, and what the global consumer class tag allows us to do is to define it more carefully, and you'll see these acronyms all over the place, the GCC, uh, if you want to think of it as the global middle class, but it's the global consumer class. But then, more importantly, I want to aggregate them, uh, individuals in the GCC across different segments and talk to that. And in particular, give you a sense of regional country spreads. And I think you'll find some really interesting data. Um, as I say, even for, for somebody like me who's worked at the data quite a lot, there were some that were... Uh, were, were were surprising. Um, I'll end off with a deeper dive and what I call early comparisons um, with respect to India and China to look at their consumer dynamics. And then if there's time, hopefully, I don't um, uh, project being longer than 45 minutes maximum, I'll take some Q&A. Okay. So let's dive into it. So what do we mean? And uh, so I should, uh, I should preempt this by saying that all the data is based on sort of household surveys that are aggregated from either the World Bank or country level data and then supplemented with um, relevant survey data uh, where possible. So this is not sort of um, based on qualitative interviews or perception-based uh, data. It's hard household, representative household survey data from the countries that are covered uh, or, or from as many countries in the world economy as possible. And certainly the big drivers, China, India, the USA, are all very well covered in this data. So how do we define the global consumer class? So just to be very clear, and perhaps uh, to sort of lock on to um, early Monday morning, not trying to convert everything into RANDs. I've given you the RAND figures on the right-hand side. So think of anybody earning below 6,000 RAND a month. And I know you're going to start doing all these calculations for yourself and your friends and family and so on. But just think of this as below 6,000 RAND a month in terms of the conversion, the straight conversion at 17 to 1, just to make it simple. Um, which we set at a daily limit of $12 per day. So that's really important. The far left figure is what we really locked on to. So $12 a day is the daily upper limit, below which if you're earning that, you would be considered poor. I've just done the simple calibra calibration on the monthly basis on 17 to 1. If you're 6,000 Rand or below per month, um, you'd be considered poor in the world economy. So if we're thinking about the global consumer class, it really isn't helpful, to be honest, to take everybody above that, right? Because that's, a, and this is the key point about this uh, webinar, is that you have to start thinking about segments of the global consumer class. And so just so you're clear on the left-hand side, I've given you the, the um, explanations. Think of them as being segmented into the lower middle class, the core middle class, the upper middle class, and then the rich, right? 
If you wanted a simple RAND conversion, again, if you're earning between six and 20,000 RAND a month, you'd be considered as part of the lower middle class, it's between 20 and 40,000. Um, so up to 40,000, but, but above 20,000, be considered to be part of the core middle class. And that's a really important one in terms of our country dynamics. Between So up to 60,000, between 40 and 60, if you like, um, you'd be considered the upper middle class and anything above 60, 61,000, you'd be considered rich per month, right? Um, these are working assumptions. You can play with the RAND conversions, but, but the PPP, the dollar versions are really important because they do represent the dollar PPP estimates for 2017 of how to think about the global middle class. Okay, so where does this leave us in terms of a global distribution? So the first thing that's really interesting is 50% of the world's population, right? So if you look at this data here, I've taken, uh, so if I could just take my pointer. So you take the, uh, the population at the time, the 2017 data, about 8, million, 8 billion people on the planet, right? So of the 8 billion people on the planet, 50% of them would be considered vulnerable. So that would be the poor, right? But for our purposes here, 50%, right, of the world's population, so about 4 billion, would be defined as being part of the global consumer class. So that's a really useful sort of initial statistic to, to anchor our discussion around, right? So we're talking about half of the planet's population in terms of the global consumer class. But here's where it gets really interesting is that the majority of these individuals, right, so when you say, you know, 50% of the people are in the middle class, well, let's dig a little bit deeper, right? 32%, right, of the full distribution of those individuals on the planet, 2.5 billion are actually part of the lower middle class, right? So just remember, again, the lower middle class would be those between six and 20,000 Rand a month, right? I've given you the upper limit is 20,000 Rand a month or $1,200 a month. So the majority of individuals are actually part of what we would consider the lower middle class. And I'll talk a little bit about what this means and how we can think about the dynamics. Mm. So I'm just taking a sip of my coffee. Um, but at the same time, there is something really important going on at the top end of the middle class distribution, if you like. And that is we've got an equal share of individuals. So about 250 million, let's call it, right? That are... Um, part of the upper middle class or the rich, right? And the core middle class, right? Are at about 900 million, right? And constitute about 11% of the population of, um, uh, of the world. So just a few reminders, as I call it, just a few things just to keep you um, focused in thinking about um, the background to this data and what drives it. The first is... Um, you know, in every single case, either the household or the individual will be consuming a basket of food and non-food items. Towards the end, when I look at India, I talk a little bit about uh, disaggregating, but uh, we don't really have uh, reflections on those food and non-food items that are being consumed. Um, you do need to think of the global consumer class as if you are a Nestle right through to an Apple these statistics are really important for you at different price points. So for multinational global corporations that are looking at global footprints and global markets, these are really important uh, data, I think, at least. Um, as I'll show, the distribution of the global uh, consumer class is uneven across country, but also by GDP per capita and so on. And I'll run through that. As I said, we're using household expenditure data so that this is not based on your perceptions and where you think you fit in the distribution and so on. The other thing that's really important, I was thinking about it last night, is that we do not reflect on what we would call the in, in a distributional sense, the top and in fact, I don't even think it's the 0.1%. It may be the 0.01% uh, that often meets us in media in engagements, right? So when we're thinking of, you know, the um, sort of high profile global CEOs and the billionaire list that you see coming out, those sort of top 50 individuals and so on are not really um, going to feature as accurately in, in this kind of data. Then in terms of what I would call income and price elasticity of demand. Um, 
you you one does need to think about price elasticity relative to income elasticity. So we often think about price elasticity. So in other words, you know, um, how price sensitive are consumers to changes in the prices of goods and, you know, demand will go down and some goods it won't and so on. But there's an income elasticity of demand that's really important for this discussion. And that's a non-linear estimation. So in other words, and I, and I like to think of it in terms of actual products, right? For... For the core middle class or the lower middle classes, income elasticity of demand tends to be positive. So you buy one, mach wash one washing machine, you go from zero to one. But as you move up the distribution, as income increases, your demand for products increases non-linearly. So in other words, you're not likely to buy a second washing machine, but you're more than likely to go from one streaming service to three or from one app on your phone to six apps as your income grows goes up. So the income elasticity of demand for um, uh, for richer consumers is much, much higher. So I thought I'd put this second last bullet there just to sort of lock into how to think, at least for me as a working assumption, how to think of these different segments. And I thought of it in terms of products. So if you're part of the lower middle class, which remember, um, are dominant, right? So they, as we saw in our previous data, are third of the world's economy, right? Your sort of go-to product would be basic white goods, something like a washing machine. As you move into the core middle class, and you've got to think globally here, don't think necessarily South Africa. As you move into the core middle class, you'd want a, a car or an automobile. As you move into the upper middle class, one is thinking about smartphones, and for the rich, it's luxury goods. Now, there can be overlap in products across the price range, of course, so if you think of financial services, healthcare, technology, but for the average sort of picture for large corporates, this is where they necessarily want to be looking for market share. Okay, so let's dig into the data. Here's the global share of the global middle class, right? The consumer class. So in other words, if we take the global uh, consumer class, those uh, 4 billion individuals, and I ask the question, how are they distributed across the planet? The answer is firstly, that China and India dominate, right? So if you look at that 21.956, it's a little bit too long, but that essentially, let me just get my point up, essentially, um, 33% of the world's consumer class or the global consumer class is resident in two countries, China and India. And that's not really surprising because they're large population economies, right? So remember that's everybody who's earning in our sort of simplest uh, RAND conversion, 20,000 RAND and above per month, right? A third of those individuals are all sitting in China and India, right? But here's what gets really interesting is over half of the consumer of this global consumer class, right, are actually only resident in seven economies. So if you run through this, yes, China and India and the USA, you'd expect, but here's where it starts getting interesting. You've got Brazil, Russia, Japan, and Indonesia, right? So if you are in a um, uh, corporate that's thinking about these types of products where the global consumer class may be, we're going to get to the segmentation, Certainly, if you're in the washing machine game, right, or in those sort of um, uh, lower parts of the distribution, you must be in these economies. So in other words, that's where your market share is going to be. I hasten to add that for, for um, corporate operating countries, and we often would think of China and India a lot, I'm not sure we would think necessarily about, <clears throat> excuse me, Mexico and Pakistan necessarily. So in other words, <clears throat> even for, for um, uh, corporates looking to a global consumer class distribution, they may miss what I would call non-traditional economies, perhaps Mexico because of the US uh, link, but not necessarily Pakistan. So in other words, a lot of this is driven by population size. I should say, there's a lot of action going in the rest, going on in the rest of the world, right? So I'm sort of being biased towards countries, but all this suggests is that there's no single country that fits in in this top sort of 10 list, uh, and hence we clump it up into the rest of the world because it's evenly distributed across the remaining uh, countries of the world. What if we 
go now into our segmentation. So just to remind you, this is the global, this is where we were, the global consumer class, so that full 4 billion. But now I want to go to the bottom end, right? Um, that lower middle class, right? That's the two and a half billion individuals, right? So these are the individuals, just remember, that are earning between six and 20,000 rand a month. Suddenly it changes, right? Suddenly you find while China and India were 33% of the global consumer class, when you move to the lower end of that broad distribution, they 44%, right? So here we can definitively say, if you are in those kinds of product ranges, right? Whether it's basic consumer goods, core retail products, um, uh, maybe lower priced food as well, you want to be in China and India, right? Because they constitute 44% of the lower middle class, right? Interestingly, as you go across that distribution, you don't see the USA dominating here, right? The USA is only over here. And in fact, as it turns out, the the lower middle classes, right? So those aspirant middle classes, maybe sometimes it's called, but those individuals who are between 20 and 40,000 a month are the ones that are essentially, right? Um, sorry, between six and 20,000 Rand a month. So below 20,000 Rand a month are essentially in developing countries. They're in China, India, Brazil, and Indonesia, right? Those four economies, account for 50% of the world's lower middle class. And I think that's a really important sort of entry point for thinking about targeting of consumers, thinking about the distribution of where consumers lie. And you can imagine if one thinks about uh, the, the sort of regional groupings you have, whether it's a BRICS and the other sort of regional groupings uh, outside of the USA, China, and India, you can understand why these are really important markets. Go down the distribution, and these are economies I can almost bet you you haven't thought about uh, uh, seriously for, for for some time as as sort of professionally as you think about global markets. Pakistan is there, Mexico and Vietnam, right? So suddenly, you know, if you were thinking about product ranges for the lower middle class, two percent of these individuals sit in Vietnam, right? Uh, more than those individuals that sit in Japan. Okay. Let's move up, right? So one more. Let's go to the core middle class. Here, the picture starts to change. So here, if you run your eyes across this table, it's the, it's the graphic, but now I'll put it in the table of that. Remember that that um, uh, core middle class number just under a billion. So that was the 861 million individuals, right? And recall, they are earning up to 40,000 right, a month, those individuals are much more evenly now spread out uh, with high income countries featuring more. So as you move up the income categories, um, the sort of China, India, Brazil, uh, Indonesia kind of story starts changing. Okay, so as you are targeting individuals that are higher up the distribution, let's say as you're targeting automobiles, right, slightly more expensive goods, where you need higher incomes, you've got China, the USA, Japan, and India. So in fact, the USA and Japan wedge in and break up the top two, right? They break up China and India as, uh, as dominant in the lower middle class distribution. Um, you, you have new economies, right? So if you are in that product price range, you have to be starting to think not just about what I would call old Europe, but also the East Asian tigers such as South Korea. Okay, uh, just to pause here, one of the things that's really important to keep in mind is these are scale based measures. So in other words, I may be excluding Luxembourg, for example, right, which is a very rich domain in Europe, right. But that's because the population is really small. And so we will get into intra-country uh, estimates, right? So what, what will influence your ranking here or the influence the country's position here is the size of the market, right? The population size. So now remember, we've gone through the lower middle class. We've gone through the core, right? How about we go one more up, right? And we look at what we've called 
the upper middle class. Remember, these are the smartphone uh, generations or smartphone consumers. Here things change, and they change appreciably in two important ways. One is the US immediately rises to the top of the distribution. So when you move into that 40 to 60,000 per month upper middle class category, you've got the USA that constitutes 25% of upper middle income, uh, uh, upper middle class consumers globally. So in other words, if you want to be operating in these kinds of uh, product uh, price ranges for whatever product you're selling, a quarter of your market share is going to be in the US. Notice in the second appreciable way that this distribution has changed is that India is nowhere to be found. So the one thing you can almost take away immediately is that when we think about the growing, growing middle class and growth rates, and we come to the population story about India versus China later on, the price points are very really different. So the Indian consumer, the Indian middle class consumer, let's put it that way, is much poorer uh, than uh, certainly the, the US and even the Chinese consumer, because China still holds its own, right? So China is that high growth story. Uh, we can say a, a lot of things about uh, the future of the Chinese economy in terms of income category and so on, but you've got still 6% um, of the world's upper middle class that are resident in, in China. And China is, holds its own, if you like, amongst uh, developed or advanced economies. So the one thing you do see is as you move up to the upper middle class, the only middle income country in the sample, right, would be China, right? The others are all sort of standard high income, old Europe, um, um, northern industrialized countries. Russia is not unimportant. So the extent to which, uh, you know, the ramifications, if you like, of the Ukrainian war um, is being felt by um, industrialized countries, by uh, large corporates operating that country should not be um, underemphasized. So if we've gone to, you can see what's happening, right, in terms of the changing dynamics as you go from core to, uh, as you go from lower middle class to core to upper, what happens when you look at the rich? So here, Right, there's an appreciable shift because for the first time, when we look at the world's rich, right, what happens is that the rest of the world, so in all the previous um, graphs of all the different segments, the rest of the world was always the highest, right? And then we looked at the country distributions. But when you look at the population of the rich, right, remember, so those are the individuals who are at 60,000 per month, right? Fully 50% of the world's rich reside in the US. So the extent to which um, global markets, uh, and we know this really well, and the strength of the US economy um, dominates uh, the world economy is partly reflected in this uh, data point, right? So if you look at the global consumer class and you're operating, say, in the luxury goods segment, I would argue even uh, in that overlap from sort of, let's say, smartphones onwards, right? Um, those kinds of consumer products with higher incomes are required, you've got to be in the US, right? 50% of the world's rich reside in the single country. And so it's for the first time that you actually see the, the US so far ahead than the rest of the world, even in terms of distributions. Um, UK, Germany, Japan uh, are there as well. But you'll notice there's a massive drop off, right? So think about it <clears throat> differently. Half of the world's rich live in the US. The next biggest country, single country, is the UK, where it's three and a half percent. Three and a half percent, right? The other thing that's also interesting about this data, and people often get confused about size of class or poverty and inequality, let's call it that, right? is that you will see developing countries, right? And you'll see some uh, particularly surprising results coming up. I won't give it away just yet. Um, high inequality countries are renowned for having, by definition, uh, um, a small proportion of really wealthy individuals. That's what the definition of high inequality is, right? And that's why you see Turkey, Mexico, Russia, right? And to some extent, even China there, right? Although this is more of a scale effect, I would argue. 
But Turkey and Russia and Mexico are a classic example of high inequality countries that have small but very wealthy populations, right? Um, and so this starts getting at, um, if you like, within country distributions. But it does mean, right, really importantly, that as you look to, uh, let's say, top end price points, um, as a as a as a multinational or as a, a goods manufacturer, let's say in the luxury goods segment, um, uh, you you will not necessarily be put off by the uncertainty and the volatility you find in core markets for you, such as a Turkey, a Russia, a Mexico, right? Um, and I think that's really important. So here's the surprising one: Where do the world's rich reside? Right. So in other words, if we take the rich, okay, and we ask the question, where are they living? Right. So now I'm just taking the top 30, right? And here's the surprising result. I don't think any of us would have predicted that we as South Africa would be number 17 on the list. Right. So we have right over 2.5 million consumers right distributed across the households they live in at 60000 rand per month and so this is a really important reminder right that when you think about the rich list by country yes the usa canada germany the uk the usual suspects are all there you saw their top 10 list but what if we generalized it and you start going down the list you get a brazil you get an egypt you get Poland, South Africa is there, right? Indonesia, Nigeria, right? Um, Colombia is there. And so in many ways, the, let's say, the, the growing pains of a developing country means inevitably you've got high level, higher levels of inequality than sort of uh, Europe. But that by definition means you've got a fair number of, of, of rich consumers uh, that not only are taxpaying and generating sort of economic activity, but are important targets for, for uh, um, corporates and companies operating in those specific price segments. Um, the, the really important thing to keep in mind is we're focusing on South Africa or even uh, a Brazil or in Egypt, but look at the numbers of those consumers compared to the US, right? And in fact, I went through the list and the USA has a population, as I've said there, that is bigger, a rich population that is bigger than the next 50 countries combined. So just think about that, right? The USA's rich population, right, is bigger than the next 50 on the list, right? It's 14 times larger, the number of rich are 14 times larger than those in the UK and 20 times larger than China. So in many ways, right, if you're thinking about global, re and, 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 you know, we haven't done this sort of, um, consequences apart from just me thinking about the obvious which is you know selling to consumers but if you think of what that does to all sorts of things around economic activity market structure uh, geopolitical influence and so on i think that's uh, useful just to keep in mind but what if we right um looked at per capita spending right so in other words if we just looked at taking um, spending and then dividing it by the number of individuals in that country, you start finding at the global consumer class level, right? Okay, just in terms of total spending, the USA still leads. So when you look at the actual numbers, right? Yes, there are those uh, far more individuals in China and India, uh, but if you if you just simply looked at rand spent times the number of individuals in that global consumer class, right, which gives you actual estimates, right, the USA is way, way ahead, right? And even in the per capita sense, right, the USA um, yields the richest on average uh, member of the global consumer class, right? So you look at that number on average, they are spending uh, forty-five thousand rand, uh, forty-five thousand um, dollars um, per annum, and so the extent to which you've got the, on average, um, a let's call it um, sustainable, uh, high spending member of the global consumer class sitting predominantly in the USA should not be um, 
uh, should not be forgotten. And then you can start to see when we look at within country estimates, which is what these are, you can start to see how the population dynamics um, start uh, um, being dampened, obviously, just because we're not looking at scale. And so you've got Hong Kong and you can see Luxembourg is there, Switzerland, Iceland. So these are necessarily smaller economies, but very rich societies. There's your other surprising one, South Africa, right? South Africa is, I think is number 12 or 50, uh, ninth, sorry, in um, yeah, total spending, but I think it's about 15 in terms of per capita, right? So that again, comes back to the quality of spending. So on average, right? It's because we've got this very high number of, um, uh, so we've got a sufficiently large number, 2.5 million of very high earning individuals that raises the per capita spending um, in, in South Africa. Okay, so but let's switch slightly now to um, within country distributions. Um, and I'm just be aware of the time. So as, as one would want to, you want to sort of try and at least disaggregate and start thinking of what's going on within countries um, rather than pure scale driving everything. So here's something which I think would make sense given the data you've seen before, but I've sort of captured it in, instead of in, in different tables and diagrams, just put it all together, is when you're looking at the population share of the global consumer class within country, let's just take India, right? What it means is when you look at the GCC within India, 87% of those individuals, that's the blue bar, actually part of the lower middle class, 87, right? For China, it's 85. What that means is when you're talking of the consumer class or, the, or maybe loosely the middle class in China and India, well, we're looking at the lower end in just in terms of income of that middle class. We're looking at individuals, just remember, who are earning between six and 20,000 rand a month. So 80, if you want to lock onto something, in India, 87%, uh, or let's call it in India and in China, over 85% of all members of the global uh, middle class are earning between six and 20,000 rand a month, right? So that's that should define and shape the kinds of dynamics that you're thinking about in terms of that middle class. Only 12% are part of the core and almost none are part of the rich or the upper middle class. That's really important. Old Europe and the US, that's why we refer to it, right, as the sort of industrialized nations because there the dynamics do change. Yes, you do have in Europe a lower middle class, but they're nowhere near as dominant. In fact, you have the, uh, let's call it the core, or what they call the middle middle class, but the core middle class, which is the stable sort of industrialized economies, have a third of individuals, right, who are part of this global consumer class. They, they're the ones who are buying automobiles and so on. And yes, you do have a significant share um, that are part of the rich and the upper middle class. But it's the U.S. where things change and look very, very different, right? It's in the U.S. where, in fact, their share of the global consumer class is very different. They have close to 40% of the GCC being part of the rich. Right, so it comes back to the point that in the US, 37% of the GCC are earning over that uh, um, $3,600 a month or over 61,000 rand a month, right? And so, the, the, in fact, the smallest proportion for the US is um, the lower middle class. So in many ways, the US is in a, in a, in a middle class sense, um, the most advanced or the richest of all economies, right? Just even if you look at within their middle class, they've got these, uh, um, they've got a disproportionate share of the middle class that are either upper or rich. Even when you look at the spend share, right? So you could say, yeah, but th those are numbers. Let's look at spending share. The pattern's basically the same for China and India, right? So 70% of spending, right? So if you look at household expenditure, 70% in India um, is accounted for by the lower middle class compared to 67% of the rich for the USA. So in other words, if you're looking at RAND spent, so if you just take for every RAND spent by the global 
or every dollar spent by the global um, consumer class in the USA, 67 cents is actually being accounted for by the rich, whereas the dynamics are different in China and India. So here's where, again, things start getting really interesting. So if we go into a country, so I just want to be clear what we're doing, right? And you say, um, let's look within country at lower middle class spenders, right? Um, what share of expenditure, right, is accounted for uh, within country by, um, um, by, by lower middle class spenders, right? So that's where... Um, uh, we're not we controlling in a way for demographic size, right? So here you find, and that's you've seen the 69 and 66 percent, right? That we saw earlier for China and India, but look at South Africa. South Africa's, you know, they've got 22 percent of the global consumer class are accounted for, right? In South Africa, or within South Africa, by lower middle class um, consumers. So you've got a, a fairly significant market that is of interest to potential providers or corporates or firms, right? But the developing countries come into play when we look at lower middle-class consumers. What about core middle-class, right? Again, you, you, you're now shifting away from an emphasis on population size dominating, but you still see now advanced countries coming into play as you move up the income ladder, but India and China are still there, but South Africa is important, right? Okay, so here you could say close to a quarter of all of China and India's, all China and India spenders are part of the core middle class, right? Okay, a quarter each. And in South Africa, it's about 18%. So where does that leave us in terms of the rich? And I think this is really, really important because it does get to tell you about the nature of South Africa's consumer market, right? And I think often we forget about this um, or we perhaps don't focus enough on um, the nature of our income distribution, right? So here, 83% of the US's uh, global consumer spending emanates from the upper middle class or the rich. Of all their spending though, right? Um, across the global consumer class, 60%, 67% is accounted for in the US by these rich consumers. So you saw that data earlier. So we're locking onto this and saying, what does it look like for other countries? And let's rank them. So the interesting thing is that South Africa comes second. So just think about that, right? That means that when you look at our global consumer class, so within South Africa, if you look at our middle class, let's say, right? And we segment them by lower, core, upper, and rich. And we ask, okay, of that full pie, who spends what amount? Well, 46%, right? 46% of that amount of spending, right, is done by the rich in South Africa. And so that's a really important statistic because it suggests that, you know, of every rand that's spent by the middle classes, 46 cents is actually spent by individuals earning 61,000 rand or more. Right. And if you combine it with what we call the upper middle class, right? So those above 40,000, uh, sorry, the, the, uh, those from, um, yes, from 40,000 upwards, that goes up to 61%. And so the way in which you think about income dynamics and consumer classes in South Africa is really important. But just to note, there, just so we don't sort of make it only a South Africa thing, but if you look at Turkey, Mexico, Brazil, these all have fairly substantial shares of really rich spenders, um, despite being, let's call it uh, possibly volatile uh, developing countries. Okay, so um, a quick deep dive, and then I'm going to stop and then we'll look at some of the questions. A quick deep dive into comparing China and India, because these are often sort of seen as uh, if you like, the world's leaders in terms of developing country growth and where, where the next sort of high-income country is going to come from. So uh, we, we know this now. It's sort of old news, although the media has gone on and on about it. But um, India is now more popular, uh, populous than China. So you've got a larger population in India than in China. Um, and that, that threshold point came through quite recently. 
But what we do find, right, is that when you're thinking about the global consumer class, right, that that gap, at least based on the projections, right, in terms of the consumer class, the global consumer class population, that gap is likely to remain for some time, at least for the next decade, right? So for specifically for China, given their growth trajectory, given the pace and nature of that growth, you can have a billion members of the global consumer class compared to India's 739 million. So yes, you do need to be in both these economies, um, but just remember the fact that India's got a larger population must be discounted by the fact that you've got a richer population effectively still in, in China and that gap's gonna remain for the next decade. Um, what about the age distribution? Now here it gets really interesting, right? When you look at India versus China, you find that in terms of the over 50s, it's actually China that has a larger share of a larger number of individuals, right? Um, that are older. So in fact, if, and that's true for the demographies, right? So China's got an aging population and India's got a youthful population. But what it means, right, in terms of consumers and the demand for particular products is really important. So if you're moving from an India to a China, in China, you think about healthcare products, you think about health services um, and all that comes with it, if, even in the insurance space, uh, relative to say, an India that has a much more youthful population. Um, and again, China, not only given that aging profile, not only um, has a much larger aged population, but also has a, a larger number of middle-aged individuals. But China also has a much bigger urban population. So again, as you're thinking about the GCC, right, which is what this is exactly, only the distribution of the global consumer class, you've got more individuals sitting in urban areas in China relative to India, where they're more evenly spread. So 78% of the uh, Chinese consumer class are in urban areas compared to only 55% for India. Again, that means a lot for not only supply chains and logistics, but also the types of products um, that may be in demand in these different countries. Projections of spending. Um, again, China's spending, you know, given those numbers are always going to be larger across the three categories relative to India. Um, and um, a larger growth is predicted over the period 2022 to 2030 for, for China relative to India. That's the nature of the growth trajectory, right? So as soon as you're thinking about where the new market's going to be um, in China and India, what are the different price points? It's not linear. Doesn't mean that China's got a youthful population, that they're all going to be um, smartphone owners in 2030. In fact, the argument would go that you better be in China for those higher end products because the nature of the growth means that the consumer is going to be richer in, um, in China relative to India. Um, we did, uh, this is my second last slide. So if you're thinking about spending by category, right? So this is just drawn from the um, household service for both countries. And, and sorry, I should have said right at the beginning, this source is really important. There's some excellent data from um, uh, this institute run by colleagues and friends of mine actually called the World Data Lab out of Brookings and the World Bank and Harvard and a variety of different institutions have come together and they've put together some excellent data on these metrics. And, and um, I was lucky enough to work with them and that's where all this data is based um, off the World Data Lab. So make a note of that, the WDL, and go and have a look at their data. Um, but when you, when you back end or you back out from household survey data and you ask, well, what are countries spending on? And you look at China and India, the on average GCC spending is more on food and beverages. So that's here, right? Um, but less interestingly on education and transport, which could be a fixed effect in terms of uh, infrastructure and movement of people. Certainly um, you'd expect more in China in terms of transport expenditure relative to India. Uh, but the interesting one is the differential in spending, for example, on education. So it's this, again, this kind of data that may start giving you typologies of the typical consumer. And so if we conclude with a deeper dive into 
uh, again, the work that the World Data Lab have done uh, for a big global client on the personal care market, you can begin to see, and I would argue this is exactly the type of stuff you almost need to be doing, and perhaps some of you have done this for South Africa, comparing us to other emerging markets or other GCC type markets, is say in personal care, you do see differences, right? So firstly, the markets are very different in size, right? So 113 billion compared to 29 billion, but there is a difference in preferences and spending patterns, right? And I mean, one doesn't want to sort of read too much into it, but you can see that Indians spending much, spend much more on hair care, right? Um, uh, and uh, relative to the Chinese, who are far more focused on skin care, right? Um, overwhelmingly, the Chinese uh, top three would be uh, skin care followed by hair care and then other personal care and eye makeup, right? All of the stuff I personally know super little about, but this is just what the data shows. But then for the average Indian consumer, it's actually skin, hair, and then perfumes. And so this kind of typology of consumer is what feeds into, I think, um, uh, price points, product offerings, as you read the market that you operate in. Okay, so let me stop there, um, go back to the beginning so that we can uh, just lock on to the main um, uh, sort of initial data points. And then let me turn to um, some of the questions and then run through them. The slides will be available. This is before tax, yes, because we can't control for tax regimes and redistribution and so on. So that can be a really important point. I think that was from Lawrence. In countries that have, let's call it strongly redistributive uh, taxes. So you may think that the global consumer class are dominant in the UK, but if there are these massive deductions for NHS and other forms of taxes, that may change things. But it, that's a bit too complex to control for with this type of data across the world. Um, ROW stands for the rest of the world. Um, um, I know did not, so Anton asks a, a note that you did not include any Arab countries or the oil billionaires in the super rich. So that's so that's what I mean again. So that's a nice question from Anton, um, and I'm slipping through the slides here because remember we we only run through when we rank order, we see the countries that we get, right? So if you don't see any Gulf states, you don't see any Gulf states. But when you're looking at the population of the rich, Saudi Arabia pitches up here, right? At 2.1 uh, um, uh, 1, 1 million in terms of the, 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 the rich. Now, if you're asking why don't we see Bahrain and Qatar and UAE, the main reason in terms of the ranking here is that the the numbers are too small, right? And so in, in many ways, that's what we, we're not picking up. The other reason could be poor data quality from those countries. And the third, of course, is that you've got such a small number of super, <clears throat> let's call it obscenely rich individuals that the data doesn't pick it up at all, right? So everybody there is a Bill Gates. And, and, and I think that's one of the challenges you have with this kind of aggregate data. And there, just to be clear, when you're looking at, let's call it the uber wealthy, or I don't know what to call it, the sort of 0.001%, you need different data. You need sort of wealth data that's often provided by banks and so on. And, um, and there is some work that's been done in that area. Um, uh, the, I haven't seen from Freedom, the question is, has the GCC future projection slides, have we, done, have we carried this out for South Africa? No. Um, I think uh, you're likely to see pretty much more of the same, at least for the uh, for the next uh, five to six years, maybe even decade for South Africa, given the low growth rates we have. Um, uh, jobs in renewable energy will immensely contribute to the global consumer class in the future. Yeah, maybe. I mean, I don't think it's going to be a massive driver. I think you need structural changes in an economy um, to see the rise of a nation like a China and India, where you see these big middle classes coming on the stream. And I think if you take this one takeaway is that economies that are on these like decadal type 
growth trajectories. I think Vietnam is one of them, just to keep an eye on. Uh, the constant growth, uh, um, uh, sort of high growth over more than a decade, China and India, Vietnam would be another. That's where you're going to see the rise of a global consumer class in those economies. Um, um, so that's a very good question on uh, from an anonymous who asked the stats on home ownership. We we don't have that. So just the other thing to remember is you know a lot of this is driven off globally representative data, and it's hard to get as far as I know, unless you go into individual countries, sort of globe global home ownership statistics of this scale, right? You may get it for advanced countries, but I think it may be hard to get it across all these countries. Um, so Mill November asked a good question, which I think is an important technical question. Would GCC measurements or stats have taken into account the standard of living in developing countries versus rich? Yes. So I just want to go back to the first slide, which refers to something called PPP. And so when you look at, at the bottom there, it says PPP estimates, purchasing power parity is exactly that. So every country's um, currency that you measure the survey in, so how much do you spend on this stuff in rands, is then converted to PPP um, uh, equivalent. So what would a rand based on purchasing power parity buy you? So it's not an exchange rate as much as it's a PPP um, conversion. Um, So Mark um, Middendorp has got an interesting point. He says it would be interesting to take total debt, consumer and government debt into account and how it would impact the distribution. Would that result in differences in spending? Yes, certainly. So again, you know, what we don't account for is how much of this consumption is debt financed, right? Which is your point, I guess, uh, as opposed to savings by, or as opposed to income financed, actual income. And I think that's important. Um, net worth rankings between countries are similar to income rankings. I think they are. I think at one level, uh, uh, the question about rankings in terms of income classification maps onto rich consumers. But here's the nuance is that you, you often forget when you look at wealthy economies, your USA, Switzerland, Japan, the UK, and so on, um, one mustn't forget the dynamics within countries that are developing countries. And I think that's the point, that in these high inequality, and maybe that's a useful place to sort of stand down, I mean, to, to land on, is that in high inequality developing countries, Russia, Mexico, South Africa, you have a high proportion of rich spenders. And I think that's what keeps the economy moving in many ways. Um, John, correct in terms of your interpretation um, uh, about the slides and the number of individuals earning more than 60K a month. Okay, just gonna give it a minute more, see if there are any more questions. Okay, um, final one from Anonymous. Isn't it disconcerting that South Africa's per capita spending is second after the US considering should we not be spending? So the, the point is our per capita is of the rich is really high. So that the reason it's high is because we've got these high quality, very rich spenders. And I think that's the point, right? So that's what keeps, so in a high inequality society, you've got um, a significant number of very, very rich individuals. And that's what's driving that ranking for South Africa. And I think in, in many ways, the one way to think about it is what we'd rather have perhaps, right? If I could put it out there, as a sort of broad long run growth trajectory is keep that ranking, but grow in terms of the numbers of individuals in the lower middle class and the core middle class, let's call it that, right? Because that's a sign of true sustainable long-run growth. And I think that's the signal you're going to see. If you want to become the next China and India in terms of the rankings, you've got to have high and sustainable growth that give you that base from which to create a core middle class. Um, yeah. Okay. Thanks, everybody.
I hope this has been useful. Now we'll stop sharing and ask the Signia team to end the webinar.